Look at that. And it is the case that we must be, if we claim to be Muslim, if we claim this book, and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad claimed this book, then we have to be consistent with the book. We have to be consistent with the prophet's sunnah. Professor William, yes. I think I will disagree with you on the issue that you are coming with the presupposition that whatever is in the Semitic tradition must be part of the Quranic validation. I would like you to give me one scenic example in which either in the Quran or in the saying of the Prophet, any plurality within Godhead is ever mentioned any divine counsel, because all the examples that we have given from the Quran is basically, if you look at the first example, which is the ruler of majesty, even the queen of England nowadays, when she talks about herself, she doesn't say, I said it, she said, we said it, number one. Number two, I know Genesis 18, or the rest of the examples that we have given, we are my Lord, but look at God comes, Rains, leaves, cries, Moses astonishes, uh, admonishes him, he repents of the evil, and God repents of the evil, for instance, or in the Talmudic and the Romantic tradition. If you can give me one example in the Quran or in the saying of the Prophet, where concrete anthropomorphism or corporeal is one example, I will appreciate number two. The example which we have given the face of God or the hand of God. Metaphorically, you have to say, I will give you a hand. I'm right. doing it for your sake. So the Quranic terminology uses it, God's sake, God's hand, God's eyes. But all of us can say that it is not anthropomorphic, it is metaphorical. Right. So what makes it anthropomorphic or metaphorical? Thank you for that. You said quite a bit, so I will try to address as many as I can recall. <laughs> Um, for giving the oversight. First, I need to qualify your introductory statement. For it, you seem to attribute to me the position that all that is Semitic is Quran. I did not, nor do I make the claim that all that is Semitic is Quran. I'm dealing with a particular motif which I do argue there exists continuity between Quranic theology, if you will, and pre-Quranic Semitic tradition. That's one. You want to clarify that. Now you asked both about an example of the, exalt the 
divine counsel in the Quran, an example of divine plurality in the Quran, an example of anthropomorphism in the Quran. And these cases will be another lecture. <laughs> but then you conclude that your question with the state or the affirmation of a position or the presentation of an argument that if I was to find such an ethical motive, then that metaphor, and you suggest that Islam, that according to Islam, this is the case. Now, I can see that according to some Muslims, contemporary and pre-modern, any suggestion of anthropomorphism must be understood metaphorically. It is also the case, however, that that was only one reading of the Quran. There were a number who insisted that the anthropomorphisms in the Quran, not just the face, the soul, the spirit, the hands, admittedly relatively sparse in relation to the Bible, but then nonetheless, versus the Sunnah, where a number of concrete anthropomorphisms of the Sunnah, which were a number of scholars refused to interpret metaphorically, for example, the famous Hadith found in Timothy, and according to whom, according to Timothy, none lesser than al-Bukhari himself authenticated it according to which Muhammad, the prophet, saw God in a most beautiful form. Two particular of the 11 narrative traditions of this particular vision, only two of the 11 mention that vision, that theophany, as having occurred in a dream. In particular, Timothy specifically has that vision occurring in the awakened state by saying, the prophet said, he prayed, he fell asleep, and then I woke up. And then my Lord came to me in the most beautiful form. This is in Timothy's collection and in introducing it, Timothy says specifically, that he, Timothy, is the author of one of the canonical, six canonical collections of hadith. Hadith being a repository of sunnah, if you will, or reports through which Muslims believe sunnah can be accessed or known. Okay. Timothy was a student of Abu Qarqa whose collection is the most hailed by all Muslims. Sunni Muslims. Of the six canonical books, Abu Qari's is most esteemed. Now, Timothy, his student, affirms that that particular hadith report in which the theophany occurs to the prophet in a waking state not a dream, that according to Timothy, Al-Bukhari himself authenticated it as sign, as sahih, as authentic. So that's one example. Now, how do we understand these anthropomorphisms? Well, that's the question. Now, it is we can take multiple approaches, and in the history, of Islamic theology, multiple approaches were taken. There were those who insisted on a metaphorical, allegorical interpretation of these texts. There were those who insisted on a zahir reading, a literal interpretation of the text. My suggestion is that the post-Quran Onic developments, that discussion, 
that dialogue, that dispute over these matters is relevant, we must examine them and see what, if anything, they can tell us about what the text actually says. But my point is that equally important is the discourse behind the text. The discourse that took place on the ground in which the Quran developed. The discourse that the Quran itself inserted itself in. I think that discourse is as informative of the text than the later discourse that we're discussing that could find no, it's map, no universal consensus on these matters. So there are examples, and I don't deny you, the Asherites, like, or others, to choose to interpret or receive these matters as metaphors. Nor would I deny the right of others to receive, interpret them literally. What I do <coughs> suggest is that we resist presenting either approach as the Islamic approach that betrays the history of the Islamic discourse on these matters. Because multiple approaches were taken, multiple exegesis was offered by Muslim thinkers recognized by the community. So that's one example um, of what on the surface is a very explicit anthropomorphic. Brother, I mistakenly came into this room, but when I came in I couldn't leave because I was listening to what you were saying. Uh, you touched upon so many points that I needed to ask questions on yes, that sir. I couldn't formulate one question to try to arrive at what I was trying to get to understand. But we can never say Allah is a man because Allah never said that of himself. He describes us in the Quran as insane. That's man. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never described himself as a man. And if anyone tries to deduce that Allah is a man, they are inventing a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. I, I have to say a stop for love when somebody calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a man. I understand. Yes, sir. Okay, just talk about that. What's your name? My name is Tarek Abu Qasim. And I, one thing I say, I started with Elijah Muhammad 50 years ago. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Thank you, brother. You took offense to me saying Allah is a man. Understand that. That was a theological statement. But it's also a historical statement. Granted, the Holy Quran doesn't explicitly say one way or the other. The Holy Quran itself does not explicitly say he is, does not explicitly say he isn't. But there's a reason I imagine we have Quran and Sunni. And the early Sunnis were real clear that the Quran needs the Sunnah for clarification. Well, I don't, you can accept that or reject it. But I do know Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said God was a man. Come on, brother. Oh, yeah, he did. And right. Sahih Bukhari, he described that's Prophet Muhammad, not the messenger, Elijah Muhammad. Right. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, described his Lord as shocks. As what? Shocks. I'm going to tell you. Give me a moment. Allah willing. Well, I want to tell you, I would let Ibn Manzur tell us. In the most important Arabic lexicon, shocks is a person with a physical body. I would 
will let Ibn al Jawzi tell us what shocks is. Shocks is a body that consists of height and length. Prophet Muhammad said his Lord was a shocks, a man, a person with a body. So Prophet Muhammad is under Islam. So Prophet Muhammad, on what I take to be your reading of the Quran, beloved, violates the Quran. See, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his God was not the God of the current Muslim world. Come on now. Uh, Sunni or Shiite, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Or Susan. See, Prophet Muhammad's God, peace be upon him, he had a body, a sora, a boom. The Arabic, sora. He had a sword, a boom. There was a human boom. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, said Adam's boom was created according to God's own boom. Prophet Muhammad not only saw his form in a vision, he described it as a beautiful form, but he said he felt it. Mm. He said this man, God, this shocks, who had a beautiful form in his vision, reached out and touched them. And the prophet said he felt the coolness of his fingertips right. in his breast. See, the God of Prophet Muhammad is not a spook. The God of Prophet Muhammad is a man. I understand if you don't want to use that terminology. Go ahead. But use the terminology that the classical Islamic tradition allows us to use. He's a shock. He's a man with a body, with a form, sarah, and it's a beautiful form. So if you have a God that doesn't have a beautiful form, that can't touch his prophet and his prophet feels his fingertips, you're not following Muhammad. You don't have Muhammad's God. And if my promise God offends you, then I'm in good company. Why a special message Come on. to the former followers of Mosiah who lies behind? A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity after the labor's meeting in Chicago to join Brother Minister Hafiz and other laborers at the National House to have dinner with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And in the course of the dinner, in the course of his sharing with us, he shared with us a particular desire of his. He said he wanted two communities descended from the Mosambo Elijah Muhammad, the community of believers under the leadership of the late Imam W.D. Muhammad, and the community under his leadership to be one community. He desired that as we are both That's right. descendant from the Muslim boy Elijah Muhammad, he desired us to be together. He said, but that community has a problem with point number 20. That's the stumbling block <laughs> to Come on, the realization of his vision. He noted correctly that in Imam W.D. Muhammad's community, there is a study of error. There's scholarship. There's a reading of the Quran in error. There's a study of the Sunnah of the Prophet. And on the basis of that study, that learning, our family under the Imam's leadership is convinced 
of the error of point number 12. So that's the stumbling block to the realization of the minister's vision. A stumbling block to unifying the two tribes that emerge from the spiritual loins of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. So I have a special message to the former and new followers of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. That message is, you can come back home. Now, you can come back home. Now, we understand why you left. In 1975, with the departure of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, as Brother Diamond so powerfully pointed out yesterday, no one can say those were not true believers in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. The fact that they nearly wholesale went a different direction does not in any way suggest they were not true believers in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. But when he departed, an argument was presented to them that they could not answer. And it was not their fault. They were convinced that as well mean as the uh, Osama boy Elijah Muhammad was, as great of a social work that he did for our people, he was yet in error as far as the Quran and the Sun is related. And so we have those who still today love the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And they will allow no one to speak ill of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. They need only to understand that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad was on the sun of Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. The Imam has engendered in them a healthy love for the Prophet and his son. Right. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has engendered in us right. a healthy love and appreciation for the Prophet and his son. That's right. So there is nothing theoretically that should prohibit the two tribes from unifying except that we need a clearer understanding Come on. Come on. of what the Sunnah is. 